Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to another session of the Women Lead uh, Online Forums in the Ladies' Room. And uh, this is brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas. I'm your host today. And, and today we are, as I said, in the Ladies' Room. And you know, the Ladies' Room is that place where women talk about things that we might not just say anywhere. And it's things that we can maybe only say to one another because... Well, because we've had some shared experiences, right? And this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to one another, and, and come away with some new ideas or maybe just some validation. We like to say that in the ladies' room, we go there. And our session today lasts for about an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. If there's something you'd like to contribute, just put it in the chat to me and I'd be happy to, to share it for you. But we really love to hear your input and hear your feedback. And, and this is far more conversation than interview. So our topic today in the ladies room is you can't skip act two. It's a profound thought. And I'm really excited to introduce our special guest today. So let me tell you a little bit about them. First of all, Elizabeth Caetano is a licensed therapist and author. And in her practice, she offers therapeutic healing with a coaching twist. I really like that. And her book, Down the Rabbit Hole and Back, tells about her journey and offers concrete tools and skills that help you get out of those rabbit holes that we all get stuck in. Next, I have Dr. Rebecca Johansson, who specializes in creating active learning environments based on techniques used in the theater to create opportunities to not only learn the latest in organizational theory, but also put it into practice. And she's been working in the fields of emotional intelligence, gender equity, and unconscious bias, collaboration and creativity, as well as working as a public speaking coach for over 10 years. And then normally I'm your facilitator, but today I'm actually joining the panel. So I'm gonna wear two hats, you know, today. And I would like to share with you my journey to find my own personal resilience factor. I'm an author and a speaker on gaining strength through the challenges that we face and ultimately turning those lessons into service to others. So let me say welcome to everybody here. And I'm so excited that you all joined me in the ladies room. Thank so you. Rebecca, I think this title was your, was your idea. So what, uh, what did that come about from? Yeah, that came about from uh, a program that I facilitate on resilience uh, that normally is in person. <laughs> and when, uh, when COVID hit uh, and we radically had to rethink the whole way that we do business, I realized that of all of the topics that I do, um, that I train in, that that was going to be the one that people would get the most immediate impact from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I pull that concept out of... Um, something that Brene Brown talks about in her book, Rising Strong, where she talks about visiting uh, Pixar's studios at one point in her career. And she saw up on a post-it note, their structure for, um, for creating a, a screenplay. Yeah. And uh, my PhD is actually in theater. So it's a structure I'm very familiar with. And in act one, you have the, you get to the background exposition, you get to know who the characters are. Uh, but then at the end of Act One, some kind of conflict has to happen. You can't have mm -hmm. drama. You can't tell a story without having some kind of conflict. So Act Two is always about the journey that the protagonist goes about to discover something new about themselves, to overcome some sort of internal or external obstacle that then finally in Act Three, they come to, in the case of Pixar, a happy ending. Uh, my, I studied Shakespeare and sometimes those plays don't end so happy, <laughs> but uh, we do Pixar movies sometimes. Yeah. I mean, they, I'm just sitting there like a sobbing bucket at the end yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. 
So, I mean, the whole point in drama is that you, in, in that dramatic structure, you can't skip act two. Act two is where the important stuff happens. Right. And oftentimes when we're faced with some kind of adversity or challenge in our lives, we want to skip straight through and try and figure out how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that. We've got to, uh, Brene Brown calls it wrestling with our story for a while. We've got to wrestle with it for a while yeah. uh, and, and figure out what exactly is it that we have to overcome? What obstacle is it that we have to overcome? Mm -hmm. um, in order to get to that happy air ending. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where, where the inspiration comes from. And I think that um, culturally, particularly here in, in, in America, we tend to like to jump straight to solving the problem and, and ignore all those bits in the middle. We want to get through that as quickly as possible. Yeah. So we make, try to make it a little montage to make it get, get, to it, <laughs> get through it as quickly as possible. But um, yeah. Yeah. that's where all the discovery happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're, um, it's interesting that you said here in America, I think we're all about minimizing pain and maximizing pleasure and, and achievement and accomplishment and so forth. But, um, you know, one thing that, that I found was that if you haven't gone through some stuff, if you haven't had some challenges, you're really not you're really not worth much to anybody. You know, it's like if your life has all just been this straight uphill trajectory and everything went just great. What have you got to offer anybody else? You know, I, I really think our humanity is lacking without some struggle and without some turmoil and without, you know, I don't think people learn a lot of lessons from succeeding all the time, you know? Well, what say you, Elizabeth? Well, to dovetail on some of what Rebecca was saying about moving through the second act is this idea, especially as women, in, we're in a culture going back to that problem solving that idolizes the brain and the thinking power and that problem solving, and it, it cuts us off at the neck where all the emotion is happening. Mm -hmm. And so those of us women that are actually more sensitive, more intuitive, we cry at Pixar movies, we, you know, we're, we're, it, we're in tune and we have all these feelings, yet we're not allowed to express them or we're weak or mm -hmm. we're not allowed to express them or we're hormonal or, you know, add, add all of the labels that go on to that. Emotional. But and The emotional that. piece is, is one of the cruxes of moving through act two. Yeah. You know, if we just try to jump over the emotion and, and not acknowledge it, it gets expressed through drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, physical abuse, shopping abuse, um, eating disorders, anxiety, depression. It's like we have this, this huge pharmaceutical company or companies in the United States that just push drugs, push drugs, push drugs, solve the problem, solve the problem. That, that's not the root. The, the, the root, the core, our being ourselves, our emotions, our sensitivity is, is part of what we need to move through something, for instance, like grief and loss. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know earlier, Patty, you had mentioned grief and loss, and I just lost my father last year. And it took a year to move through the second act. And I'm not over it, don't get me wrong, but I'm not waking up with night terrors either. Yeah. So, but literally it took a year and it took a year of me just honoring and saying, I just have to be. Mm -hmm. All I can do is just be in this moment. And if I need to cry, I need to cry. And if I need to yell, I need to yell. And if I need a mental health day, I need a mental health day. Yeah. Because as you said before, I'm not, good. I'm not gonna be good to anybody in that state, certainly. And so I, again, I go back to it. There really is something about that emotional piece that people want to just jump right over and pretend isn't there or shove down or medicate. And, and it, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I'm going crazy. You know, if I cry, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's well, you know, and I think especially with, with grief, you don't get over grief. And that's something that people don't understand who have not been on that journey mm -hmm. is that it, it never goes away. It just, it changes, you know, mm -hmm. but there is still, you know, there's still that underlying grief all the time. It just, it just changes you, you know, and usually the people that are telling you to get over it or move on, or shouldn't you be better by now? 
are people who've never experienced that. You know, I mean, it's yeah. sort of that way in, in every area of our lives. The ones that are dispensing the most advice have the least amount of, of reason to well, do so or credentials to Brown do so. Brown talks about empathy as a key piece of us connecting and connection yeah. is part of resilience. Mm -hmm. So we go back to just being able to tolerate someone else's emotion, let alone our own, is also part of act two. Yeah. I love the analogy. I think, you know, I did theater in my past too. So <laughs> I totally Me too. love the analogy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, the, this, these concepts of um, connection and emotion and empathy, they all go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, you, you just, you have to just move through it. Yeah. So what does resilience actually mean? You know, because it, it honestly feels, um, you know, when, when I was, um, I developed a talk about resilience back in probably 2004, I was working with, um, with a group of high school students as part of a, uh, an organization called the Jenna Druck Foundation. And these were high achieving high school girls. I mean, like uber achieving superstar girls. And once a year, they would come together for this leadership forum. And, and I would look at these girls and these girls were superstars in, in sports, they were superstars academically, they were superstars in their community, they were, there wasn't a whole lot of area where they had failed. So I, I thought, what's gonna happen to these girls the first time something doesn't go right for them? So I put together this talk, which ended up morphing out into something that I did just for women in general, and then ultimately became my book, you know, about the resilience factor. And, and the idea is, what do you do when everything goes to hell? What do you do when everything falls apart? And these young girls, they were like, it was a concept they hadn't even thought of because everything they had done had worked and they were conditioned to that, you know? And so I was like, what's gonna happen when you don't get into the school you wanted to get into? What are you gonna do when your, your parents divorce right before you're leaving for college? What are you gonna do when you break a leg on the track in a track meet, you know, or, and you know, they would come up afterwards, they were like, it was such a foreign concept to them. And, you know, so I, and like I said, I talked about it a lot and then it seemed like it almost became a, a buzzword everywhere you turned, everybody was talking about resilience, resilience, resilience. How do we make sure that it doesn't become just the word of the day and people really begin to internalize it as a core value and, and something that they build their lives on? I mean, Rebecca, you're doing these workshops, you know, all the time. Now you're doing these online and so forth. So how do you help people internalize what that even means? Well, I mean, I, I think something that I reiterate in, in a lot of the different uh, material that I, that I cover in my, in my courses is um, that these kinds of, of uh, sort of soft skills are, are critically, I, I like to say they're critically rooted in our habits of mind. And we can, we can formulate and we can grow and we can expand um, what, our, what we're capable of doing <laughs> through mm -hmm. repetition. Mm -hmm. And so, so I like to focus on it as, yes, yeah, some people are, are born with a natural resilience. Some people have been forced to be resilient early on in their life by not succeeding. Um, and I find that the people who, who have faced more adversity early on in life are actually much more resilient than, than uh, people like the, the girls that you described. Um, but that through, through active practice, we can expand our capability to be more resilient, to be more emotionally intelligent, to be more attuned to, um, to uh, social injustice. You know, all of these things that through exposure, through understanding, through a willingness to put it into practice, then it becomes more second nature rather than just a buzzword. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that what this moment in, in the world is teaching us right now is that um, one of the things that I, that I reiterate is that you have to anticipate the worst case scenario. 
I mean, I was speaking for organizations, mm -hmm. but if you aren't prepared to, um, to radically accept something that has happened uh, to you, then it's going to be really hard to bounce back from it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, with what happened with COVID-19. Yeah, I, I gave myself about three days to curl up on the couch and put the straw inside of the wine bottle and curl up into a little ball. Uh, and then I said, okay, no, you're practiced at this. You, you teach this to other people. Uh, you need to radically accept that this is the new way that the world is going to work for a while. Uh, and now that we, now that we have worked, allowed ourselves to feel, <laughs> I've allowed myself to feel, now I need to figure out a process to work through those feelings and figure out how to emerge out the other side. Mm -hmm. So it's about practice and practice and practice. And um, some people, unfortunately, do get a lot more practice at it throughout the, the course of their lives, through the circumstances of their lives. Um, but it doesn't mean that just because you've never faced too much adversity in your life that you can't that you can't figure out how to have a strategy for coping. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to delineate between what you just said, Rebecca, about anticipate the worst case scenario from a business perspective yeah. as opposed to a personal perspective. Yes. Because in my realm of psychology, if we're an individual and we go around as chicken little, the sky's going to fall, yes. we <laughs> become crippled in anxiety and fear and live fear-based. So the that idea, there's two, I think actually, and I'm just getting this now, there's very two distinct things, one for business and business resiliency versus personal resiliency. Yeah. Um, I like to start with a working definition of uh, basically a, a person who is able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult situations and uh, I've been doing this 20 years and, you know, yes, I see people who are coming in who are having crises, but I like to think that this thing called resiliency is something that you actually have and you don't even know. Yeah. And then go, dovetailing back into what you were saying is this idea of then discovering it, making it conscious and then exercising it. So my counseling with a coaching twist is very action oriented. It's very positive oriented. My book is very action oriented on take the steps to strengthen the skills you actually already have. Right. Yeah. I, I actually wrap I'm a huge Alice in Wonderland fan, obviously, but I'm also a Wizard of Oz fan. And I do, I, I reference Dorothea, you know, we all have the red shoes we just sometimes forget or don't know how to click them together to make the magic happen. Yeah. So, so really discovering our own inner strengths and skill sets. You know, what's worked for you in the past? How did you manage this in the past? A sense of self-efficacy is a huge part of resilience. Yeah. And negative thinking gets in the way and gets into that fear-based living. And so, so yeah, just, just wanted, I'm yeah. like, oh, wait a minute. This, yeah. yeah, no, I, 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 th I was having like three thoughts happening in my brain yeah. at the same time and they all came out at once. But yeah, just to clarify what I, what I was thinking when, when I was bringing that up is that, um, you know, I, I work with organizations to, to think about anticipating that change is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and in life as a human being, adversity is going to happen. Change is going to happen. Uh, and, and, uh, acknowledging that that's just a reality of, of how life works mm -hmm. and, and developing those strategies that you have internally or develop, discovering new ones mm -hmm. um, to help you figure out how to navigate those, those moments. Because if, uh, if you walk through life and think that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you, then you're going to be in for a really big surprise when something bad happens to you. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, and, and I think people who are, um, who are aware that change is just a part of life um, are, are in a position where they're able to accept the truth of those kinds of circumstances much more um, quickly and move through that process even more quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's funny that, um, that, we, that you said, Elizabeth, um, people are resilient and they just don't know, because that's one of the things I say all the time is, you know, you just don't know how resilient you are because you haven't had to use it yet, but it's there, believe me, it's there, you know, and, and you have a choice of, you know, like if you think of the change continuum of going from, you know, the, the 
impetus of it into some sort of a transition, but then finally ultimately making it all the way to the other side of transformation. And, and people can get stuck in that transition place where, no, 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 I liked this other thing back here so much better. And you can't make me, you know, you can't make me go. You can't make me go. And, and I like to say, you know, we all know that person who is still stuck in the great layoff of 2007 and they're still talking about it, you know, but there, when you finally say, okay, this happened, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, a lot of times change is thrust upon us. We didn't have a choice. Nobody asked if we wanted it. It mm -hmm. just was there. And, and that's not to say that people who choose to make changes don't go through some of these transitions as well, but a lot of times change is an external event and it, it comes upon you and there you are and what are you going to do with it? And you can go back and forth with denial and anger and all of these other things, but ultimately, you know, it, it, to be healthy, you have to find a way through it. You have to find a way to the other side of that. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise there's just, you know, there's no growth. You just become, you're just stuck. You know, there, I, um, I, my, my first husband, it was a long-term marriage, 23 years and, and just literally walked out on us like overnight, just met the love of his life and decided he just could not live without her. And, you know, Sam, we were gone. It was, it was amazing. If you look up in the dictionary midlife crisis, I'm pretty sure his picture is right there. But, um, what was what was interesting to me was that um, I obviously I didn't have a choice about that. He made the choice for for all of us, and but at the time I hearkened back to a woman that I had known when I was in high school, and her marriage had broken up. And this woman was the most bitter, hateful shrunken prune of a person and and as a teenager that had made an impact on me it was like this is that is not who I'm going to be this is not going to define me somehow I'm going to figure out my way out of this you know I, I can't change what it is but I can sure change what I do with it you know that's where we have our power that's where you know where we can actually impact or affect any kind of change but how funny that that I haven't thought about that woman in a long time. And it just popped into my head that that was a huge life story to me at a, a clearly a very pivotal time in my life of, Oh, wow. I'm not, I'm not going to be that not going to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Adrian, jump in here anywhere. I know you've got lots of stories and lots of experiences and lots of opinions. <laughs> you know, I've been taking it all in and it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, you guys have touched on some really interesting things, and I think you're right. Um, change is usually something that is thrust upon us. It's not, I'm going out and taking on something that's outside of my comfort zone. I'm, it, it at least gives you some modicum of control if you decide to accept that challenge to whatever, pick up and move across the world mm -hmm. uh, to a place where you don't know the language or whatever. Right. But you're right. Um, when you there's job loss or the loss of a relationship or um, the loss of a person, that's not something you get a choice of. Mm -hmm. um, and something that there's a couple of different things that I was thinking. One was you were talking about uh, Elizabeth about how it's been a year and you still don't feel like you're ever your father. And I remember I was probably in late elementary school and my mom was talking with a woman and she said that her husband had died very suddenly of a heart attack. And this was in the very early seventies where she was, you know, graduated from high school and got married and had kids and was a stay at home mom as pretty much everybody was. Mm -hmm. She had these two young boys and, you know, no real education beyond high school. And that she immediately like had to worry about her kids in a financial sense, I mean, because it was, he was so young and it was so unexpected um, that she like enrolled in school and got a, you know, immediately got a just temp or whatever kind of secretarial job, enrolled herself in school to get better skills. And she said it was finally, it was about a year in and she'd gotten a better job and had a little more income and was finally, you know, like 
her kids were doing okay in school that, you know, and she kind of felt like, oh my God, my kids are okay. I think, you know, it's not going to be easy, but we're okay. And she said, finally, it took like a year before she really felt like it, it was time for her to grieve. Yeah. And, and, you know, and she had been sharing with my mom that a lot of other people were like, what? <laughs> it's been a year. Uh, what's your problem? Why aren't you over this? And she's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I didn't think, you know, I didn't really get to think about myself or my own feelings or anything because it was all about the survival and, and watching out for my two young sons. So I think that there's no, there's no time limit really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And survival will trump moving through the second oh, act yeah. every time but it doesn't mean it's just gone and goes away. It's right. just waiting in the wings to come on stage. <laughs> Use the analogy and kick your ass. Sorry, but yeah. <laughs> that's what it's going to do. <laughs> true. Yeah, it's true. And when you when you least expect it, you know, just <laughs> out of nowhere, you know, watching a Pixar movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think it's, um, I, I don't think society does a great job of preparing us for, um, for loss, for failure, for, you know, um, Bill Gates has a quote um, that's one of my favorite quotes about this. And he says, success is a lousy teacher. It makes us think we can't fail. And coming from a, a, a man who, you know, uh, had the success he did at a very young age and so forth, I think that's a very profound statement, you know, and then he in conversation he followed it up with and it also makes you think that you don't need to learn anything you know it all it all just worked it all just came and, and aren't i great and aren't i wonderful and i uh, my husband and i were on a bike ride a few weeks ago and and i i had three kids i i have three kids um my oldest son was the perfect baby he was the perfect pregnancy he was the perfect baby he is the perfect young man he is the perfect daddy he is just perfect it's just pretty hard to find anything wrong with him. I mean, I can tell you some things about him, but we're not going to go there. He's, he's pretty perfect. And then my middle son, Joel, was just a, a stinker from the beginning. He just, he just came out of the room that way. And, you know, just, uh, it was just a challenge, you know, the whole time, you know, and then I have my daughter who has had, who's the baby of the family, and she's, she's had her own challenges and, and, um, and things as well. Anyway, we we're on this bike ride. And I said to my husband, I said, you know, if Steven had been an only child, I would have been one of those insufferable parents who talked all about, you know, how everyone else's kids are so rotten. And I don't know what's so hard about being a mother and, you know, I, judging everybody around me, you know, based on my own experience that was so freaking easy, you know, and, so I, I do, you know, I go back to what I said at the beginning. I do think that challenges and adversity just makes us better people. Otherwise, we're just freaking insufferable, you know, just we, we are. Well, then the good news is pretty much all of us have gone through adversity. I mean, there are very few people who haven't gone through some sort of adversity. Yeah. So the good news is we're all doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's a few out there. I think, you know, it could maybe send them through the karma, karma tunnel a little bit. Or it's something. a great reframe. Adversity is good. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we spend an awful lot of time running from it and not wanting it. <laughs> so Rebecca, what made you want to make resilience so much a part of your corporate training? What, what led you to that? Well, I, I started off early on uh, when I was doing the corporate work, uh, wading into the area of emotional intelligence as a, as a broader subject. Yeah. Um, and it started because I, w I was in grad school and I was um, starving, <laughs> starving student. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the, uh, the head of the, or one of the associate deans at the business school at UC San Diego um, had, was talking to me about, uh, putting together some kind of a program that merged uh, soft skills training, executive training with theater skills in order to, to reinforce them, the, the ideas of it. We started working on an emotional intelligence program where I collaborated with an organizational psychologist 
to develop these these exercises around um, reinforcing the concepts of, mm -hmm. of emotional intelligence. And, and what I discovered is that, I mean, emotional intelligence is this big, broad, overhead topic, and uh, it has these little pieces within it where you can do a deeper dive, and resilience is, is one of those. And I was actually requested to develop a program on it by a company that I work with out in the UK uh, as part of my emotional intelligence uh, offering. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it, it started off as just a 45 minute um, webinar that I was leading for, for a group of their clients. And they liked it so much, they asked me to put together a three hour program for their executive team. Mm -hmm. And it, it just sort of snowballed from there that more, the more I mentioned it, the more I was working with people that said that they really had an interest in it. Mm -hmm. And so it expanded into that. And now uh, once, once everything changed back in March, I looked over all of the courses that I've been working on over the last 10 years. And this one was the one that seemed like it was going to be the most immediately impactful for people, not just organizationally, but internally. Okay. And when, when, I'm, when I'm working on this topic, I always say, we're going to start with the personal resilience stuff. We're going, to talk, we're going to start talking about how you personally, individually need to develop your resilience strategies because unless you are personally resilient, you can't uh, impart that onto the larger organization or your team that you're managing mm -hmm. um, if you don't have those individual skill sets yourself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we like to think that emotions don't, like when we go to work, we leave those emotions outside there, but they impact everything that we do. We can't, we can't not feel. Mm -hmm. We just can't. It's mm -hmm. impossible to not be feeling. Yeah. And so even if we are engaging in Zoom, we've been able to, to figure out how to pivot the business and we're working from home now and we're Zooming. We're still dealing with all of these emotional factors that are now even more inseparable from our work life because, you know, I've, I've got tons of friends that are also trying to, to be on a Zoom call while home homeschooling their kids and, and, you know, dealing with, uh, with getting their kids home from college because they suddenly had to, to move back in with them. And, you know, there's all these outside factors that are impacting your ability to just interact like this with your job anymore. Right. right. So that's why I found that, that it's something that people are, are much more aware now that they're, that that line is blurred between our own personal ability to be resilient and our, uh, the way that we can pass that on in our workplaces. I think it's awesome when, um, when you start working with people that are at a very high leadership level in an organization, because um, somewhere along the way, especially if they're of a certain age, you know, they have, you know, swallowed the lie that they have to be all that. They have to be strong and they can't bring their emotions to work. And they, they have to always show this stoic, you know, whatever. And then when you start bringing in topics around emotional intelligence or uh, resilience or something, you know, what my experience has been is that they still keep trying to push. It. Yes, we need, we need to train our managers in all of this. It's like, no, let's talk about you. You know, I mean, the, the weight of the company is hanging on your shoulders. You mean to tell me that's not kind of, kind of rough right now. And to see, you know, to give them permission to not be all that all the time i think is is such a an important thing you know Absolutely. well and the the joke is we are emotion first we're fight flight or freeze that is hardwired into us yeah. from day one to survive right. and the emotion is going to flood and again resiliency is the ability to manage that flooding mm -hmm. because it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You can do all the thinking you want in the world. And if your adrenaline decides to shoot up because your subconscious, semi-conscious perceives a threat, you know, Brene Brown had a funny story where she's like, you know, oh, what if, what if bad people come and jump out of the bushes and use a machine gun against us as she and her husband are coming home from the perfect date? You know, and her brain goes there and it's like, she made it okay for us to like sound a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> the bottom line is her blood pressure went up, her adrenaline went up. She yeah. was thinking, but she was scared first. Right. 
and right. and yeah, I, I forget what does she say. We we try to forego or we try to skip over the other shoe dropping, mm -hmm. and the other shoe's gonna drop. The question mm -hmm. is, what are you gonna do when the other shoe drops? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're gonna freak out, <laughs> you know, especially if you tend to be more of a you know freeze or flight person, right? You know, and then if the emotion and the adrenaline, something that men have trained themselves into, is I'm gonna fight. Whereas women tend to more freeze and run, but that's where that piece that Rebecca was talking about comes into play. Of, but I can practice not freezing. I can practice not running. I can practice assertiveness. I can practice the tools and skills that help me to be more resilient. You know, we have to um, we have to share. Our, our struggles with people. I really believe that, that, um, that it's a service and it's a gift that we give to others because you're giving them permission to go through their own stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and when you try to look like you've got it together or this isn't bothering me or I'm so stoic or I'm so this, or I, or I, need, to, um, I need to stand up and show my faith and not really show that I'm broken and, and so forth we're not really, not only are you not doing yourself any, any favors, you know, because you're trying to stuff all this stuff down, but we're really not serving the greater good, you know, by doing that. And there's a, a woman named Nora McEnery. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of her, but she, um, she did this fabulous Ted talk. And uh, after my son passed away in 2017, probably the following year, everybody and their brother was sending me her talk. And I was, and that's one of those things that you're like, okay, thanks, whatever, thank you. Okay, all right, you know, number 25, thank you again for this link. But anyway, I, uh, I listened to it finally. And she is so, she's funny as all get out. She's very funny, but she was also incredibly transparent in this talk. And she shared her her husband had passed away and um and she shared what that was like to be with him right up until the moment that he passed away and and there were things that she shared in that talk that i mean spoke to my heart so deeply because they were things that i felt that i could not share with anybody who had not experienced that there was nobody that would understand that emotion or that irrational thought or that anything and and listening to her talk about it i was like i, I mean I, I sat on the couch and i was bald you know because it was she there there was you know i won't go into it, but there was a particular thing that she shared that was just like i didn't think anybody could understand that and you know i i later on i sent her a message through her her um website or her pod site and i i just said you know, I'm sure 50 billion people have told you this, but that helped me. You know, like Elizabeth, you said, I'm not going crazy. I'm not going crazy because look, this person mm -hmm. felt that same way. This person had that same thought. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest gift that comes from learning something, you know, of, of developing these skills is being able to give it to somebody else. You know, being able to serve someone else with these things that you've learned. Well, and I think, too, one of the things we can do, again, when someone comes to us with, for instance, grief and loss, instead of trying to fix it, going back to Brene Brown and empathy, just be with them. Yeah. And this is also why emotional intelligence is so important in the workplace. Most people just want to be, they're seeking to be understood. Yeah. They're, they're seeking to have a connection. Mm -hmm. And they want to connect, but the way business is done in, in this culture, it can be very comp competitive, very acrimonious, very, um, you know, attacking. It, it's, it's just, it's a very negative space or not all, all companies, obviously, but many, many companies, um, which mm -hmm. had me running to be my own boss because the only person I could fire and get mad at was myself because uh, really I just couldn't handle couldn't hack it, <laughs> you know, being more of a positive person and teaching positivity and, and emotional intelligence and uh, all of that. I, I just, it, I was too sensitive. 
I, I just, I did not flourish in those kinds of environments. And mm -hmm. I love that, that EQ, emotional intelligence, is really coming forth in the workplace because it is so, so necessary. And women are what, 60, 64% of the workforce nowadays? Mm -hmm. I mean, minus COVID, but <laughs> you know, more and more. And we bring emotions more readily to, to the business world. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. I, I like to, to think, um, you know, I was sort of just reviewing resilience and, and the handouts that I give and the, the skills and the tools that I teach. And I came across something called the seven C's of resilience. And I didn't, I didn't make it up. I can't, I can't claim it, but it talks about a sense of control, competence, coping, confidence, connection, which we've talked a lot about, personal character and contribution. Yeah. So the seven C's of resilience, that's kind of a nice working definition, I think. And, and it really kind of struck me as, yeah, that really kind of encompasses a, yeah. a lot of, of what goes into resilience, even though, I mean, it's also, you, you mentioned Rebecca, that e, emotional intelligence is this huge thing. So is resilience. Yeah. And, and it's, okay, how, how can I kind of quantify that and bring it into, okay, but what does that mean for me? You know, I, I have a client um, up in the Seattle area, and they are um, they're scientists, electrical engineers, uh, magnetic scientists. They, um, I, I mean, these are people that are, I don't even want to know what their IQ is probably. You know, they're just so brilliant. And um, the first time, I've worked with them a number of times over the years, and, and the first time I went to work with them, I was so intimidated because of their degrees and their their IQ and their whatever. And man, when we started talking about emotional intelligence, about connecting, about, you know, behavioral differences, about, I mean, they just became just like everybody else. You know, I can't make this work. I can't connect with this person. I don't know what to do about this. I have no emotion emotion around this particular thing and I feel like I should and it I mean it was just a it was a lesson to me but it was just a you know further you know further evidence that we are just really all the same underneath the skin everybody everyone needs everybody needs to grow everybody needs to learn everybody needs to be loved everyone needs to be heard Yeah, I work a lot with uh, with people who are in high tech and people who are in uh, biological sciences, and um, and I think that that's the that's the most challenging piece for them. I, I work with them a lot because they they went into the the business that they're in uh, because they like solving a problem that's in front of them, a, a, an object that they can wrap their brain around or that they can physically touch yeah. and solve, and then they become so good at that job that they get promoted now to managing people. <laughs> um, and it's so it, there people are fluid people are changing people go through emotional changes people respond to adversity differently than an object yeah. does yeah. And, and that's where they they find themselves at a loss of, of I, I don't know um, how how to be a good leader to to these um, to the people that are reporting to me and and that's where they really realize the value of of Oh, okay. I need to understand the impact that I'm having on my team emotionally. Yeah. Um, I need to understand, um, you know, what what <laughs> motivates them, yeah. how they get through. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So it's it's a really interesting challenge to see um, to see that that's a skill set that they suddenly become very aware that they need to develop. Yes once they're forced to interact with people on a whole new level. <laughs> right, right. And, and it's a hard thing sometimes for them to think, hey, I can't nail this. I yeah. can't, you know, I, I, all my intellect has worked before up to this and none of this stuff works. I, I had this one young woman who said, um, I'm just not comfortable when they bring me a problem. I don't, I don't know what to say. I, I know I should care, but I, I don't care. Am I terrible that I don't care? Is it wrong that I don't care? <laughs> And it was like, no, it's not wrong. It's, it's brilliant that you 
recognize that there's a deficiency there. So that's something that we can begin to work with. Yeah. 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 I actually worked with a, a group. It was the last in-person training that I did right before, <laughs> before we all got locked inside. Before yeah. and after. <laughs> <laughs> Pre, Pre-COVID. Uh, and, uh, and we, we, we worked quite extensively on a, a conversation that she had to have because she, she felt very much that she was at a disadvantage in the conversation that she needed to have with a direct report who was, who was dealing with a very challenging um, personal issue mm-hmm. and it was impacting their work. And she felt that it was a detriment to the, her approaching the conversation because she knew the person very well, had a personal emotional connection to them and understood exactly what they were going through. Yeah. And I, it took a really long time for me to get through to her and say, no, that's actually a really good thing that you, that you have this kind of a personal relationship and that you understand. Because even if you have to tell her eventually that, no, you can't make the accommodation for her, yeah. she knows that it's not a cold, emotionless decision that you're making. You have a rapport, you have a relationship yeah. that, um, that helps her feel like she's been heard. Yeah. And you know, sometimes that, that happens. Like we, we, we aren't, I mean, it's going back to what we talked about, about having, a, facing adversity and oftentimes adversity is thrust upon us and we don't have a choice over it. Um, that, um, that sometimes honesty from outside sources can help us to see the reality of the situation. Yeah. Um, but, but honesty met with empathy. Yeah. One with this particular woman that you're talking about, she already has one of the key components of resilience, which is self-awareness. And same with who you were talking about, Patty, and and the idea of, okay, I can learn, I can grow. That flexibility is so important in being resilient. So again, going back to, well, I actually do have these tools and skills. I just need to acknowledge them and get conscious with them Mm -hmm. and then practice them on a, on a more conscious level. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, ladies, this has been a fabulous conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And I know that, that those who listen to this afterwards are going to be, um, super, super excited about, um, what we've had to share here today. And I hope moved as as we all were here. So I wanted to really quick give you a, a chance to maybe share some of your, what you've got going on in your world. And so I'm gonna show this really quick. So um, first of all, Elizabeth, do you wanna talk about what, what's going on within your world? What kind of offers that you might have for our audience? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I do have a, a guide to stop stalling and start living at my navigatechanges.com website. Um, I also have my book available, um, free shipping, no tax currently, and a free gift, Down the Rabbit Hole and Back, Stop Believing the Lies and Live Your Own Truth, and that's available at downtherabbitholeandback.com. And then I also am doing uh, one-on-one adult uh, therapy via telehealth still at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also I uh, have online scheduling for that through my Navigate Changes website. Nice. So that's me okay. right now, what I'm working on. Awesome. Rebecca, how about you? Yeah, I've been doing uh, about once a month, I've been delivering some free uh, one hour long uh, virtual online uh, resilience programs called Harnessing Resilience. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next one is going to be coming up on July 10th. Um, But I usually have them about once a month and I put them on my website, Mm -hmm. RebeccaJohansson.com. And I'm looking at sometime in July, I'm going to be doing a program around a longer program around emotional intelligence, about two to two and a half hours. Uh, And I'll be announcing information on my website when that comes up. And that is probably going to be doing a pay what you can. uh, Yeah program because everybody's got different economic needs at the moment and I want to try and help people out while being sensitive to, to everybody's financial needs right now. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really awesome. And uh, as for me, um, I have a book called The Resilience Factor is Your Superpower that was published through um, Women Lead Publishing. Uh, it's available on Amazon. And then my website is The Resilience resilientjourney.net. For the most part, my website is a a host for my blog. 
and it's where I write my heart, where I write what I'm uh, thinking about at the time, and uh, and try to bring awareness to um, substance use disorder and so forth, which was how we lost my son. So that's pretty much what I've got going on there. So. Any last words, ladies, before we wrap it up for the day? I, I have so much appreciated the conversation with you. No, I just want to thank you both for, for engaging in this. Uh, I think this is a, probably one of the most important skills that anybody can, can practice and start working on right now, because I have a feeling that um, the world is going to be rapidly changing. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I really appreciate the dialogue and the conversation and, and uh, agree that the connection is amazing and I always enjoy uh, the ladies room talks and learn about myself as well as others. And uh, yeah, again, what, what Rebecca said is really is such an important conversation and uh, tool set to learn. Right. Well, again, I really appreciate the time that you've spent here with us. And uh, to any of you that are listening to this afterwards, please take advantage of the offers, you know, that have been made to you. Reach out to any of us at any time if you feel like you are um, down a rabbit hole and can't figure your way out. <laughs> then, uh, and we're, we're happy to, uh, to help you. So everyone stay safe and we'll see you next time in the ladies room. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.